Kenji, beautiful, roll ISO. All right, team, we're taking this webinar live. Again, remember Chris, no need to say anything until you see yourself take over that screen. All right, team, let's go ahead and have a great webinar. I'm taking this live in three, two, All right, good morning, everyone. My name is Chris. Uh, I'm from Searchlight Pictures, and thank you all for joining us this morning for our press conference with Amir Questlove Thompson in support of his upcoming film, Summer of Soul. Um, please use the Q&A feature to submit any questions at the bottom, and we'll get through as many as we can. Um, so Amir, just to get us started, can you tell us about how you first learned about the footage? OK, so uh, I first inadvertently saw the footage back when the Roots first went to Tokyo in 1997. And uh, my translator for that, for that tour, who knew, you know, I was a soul fan, um, took me to a place called the Soul Train Cafe. Uh, so unbeknownst to me, I was watching two minutes of Sly and the Family Stone's performance. But because it was what I know to be camera two, which was like the bird's eye view, uh, nosebleed uh, section, I didn't know I was watching the Harlem Cultural Festival. I just assumed that uh, all festivals in the 60s were from Europe because America really didn't have that culture yet, um, only to find out exactly 20 years later when David Dennerstein and Robert Favalent uh, um, told me that they had this footage and they wanted me to direct the film. So. Um, first seen it without knowing it in 97 and presented to me in 2017. And even then I didn't believe it was real. Okay, uh, next up, what part of the process in making this film did you feel the greatest shift within yourself as an artist and storyteller? Was it looking through the footage, interviewing talent and festival attendees, piecing it all together or the dialogue you've had with those who've seen your film? Um, Wait, just so I can make sure, just say the first part of the question. One more time. Yeah, what part sure. of the process in making this film did you feel the greatest shift within yourself as an artist and storyteller? I got you. Um, you know, without, <laughs> without being all touchy-feely with it, um, this project more than anything has helped me develop as a human being. Um, for all of you journalists out there, you know that sometimes artists can be really neurotic, uh, living inside our heads. And, um, you know, it's kind of weird that even though I wrote the Creative Quest book, in which I actually had to, there was one point where I caught myself like going back to, through chapters five through eight, um, mainly dealing with how creativity is transferable. Um, I will not hesitate to admit that um, of all the things that I've done creatively, this is the one that I was really, really um, nervous about. And by nervous, I mean scared, um, partly because I'm a perfectionist. And um, what, what I will say is that this film has really brought out an awareness and a confidence in me um, that I never knew that I ever had. And, you know, a lot of the times, everything that I do created creatively is behind a shield, you know, behind a drum set, behind my dad, behind Black Thought, behind Jimmy, behind turntables. Um, with the exception of teaching at NYU, you guys have never like experienced me one-on-one, -on -one, you know, I have, I have the safety of Instagram or a book. Like there's always a barrier that gets you from getting in there. And that's sort of like how I thought I liked it. Um, so I will say that um, 
the amount of confidence that I got as a human being, um, this 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 was a game changer for me. Um, not saying that I'm gonna go through life like without fear and do Will Smith's uh, uh, cannon jump or something like that. But um, yeah, but on a technical side of thing, I also learned, despite this long ass answer I'm giving you, I also learned uh, the power of editing. Uh, you know, most Roots albums are these gargantuan everything but the kitchen sink. This is what I'm bringing to the table. Um, my first draft was like three hours and 35 minutes. And this is where I really learned that less is more and less is impactful. Like the three hour and 35 minute version of the film probably wouldn't have hit you in the gut more than a very succinct two hours. Sorry for that long answer. <laughs> Okay, why did you choose to focus much of the film on gospel music and the faith that has been in the background, if not the foreground, of some of the performers? Um, hmm. uh, okay, that's a weird way to look at it. Um, as far as I'm concerned, uh, there was a perfect balance um, of soul music, of free jazz, of salsa music of the, the one genre that I truly left out was comedy um, because it would have taken me a good 20 minutes for, for me to really make sense of how the humor of the day worked for that audience, like why they were killing. Um, however, for me, um, the gospel aspect of it, I kind of seen gospel and free jazz as one and the same thing. Um, oftentimes, like I'm, I'm a guy that's always doing like litmus tests with people as far as like testing music out on them. I'm always making playlists for people. I'm DJing for people. You think like you're just dancing to music, but I'm really like testing people. So there's no time in which I'm presenting music in which I'm not conducting an experiment. You just think that I'm DJing or you just think that I happen to put the song on, but I'm really like looking for reactions and see what people respond to. Um, but this one thing I always noticed uh, when I play like soul music, really intense soul music for younger people, they tend to find like James Brown yelling like humorous. <laughs> like it, that's funny to them because we live in a meme GIF culture. So like those three seconds of something out of context can seem funny to people. There was a lot of, um, I guess what we can call primal musical expression or primitive exotic expression or you know, just layman's term, like people acting wild. And I wanted people to know that that was more uh, of a therapeutic thing than anything. So if it's uh, a gospel singer that's catching the spirit, if it's Sonny Chirac doing one of the most atonal, destructive, violent souls I've ever seen on a guitar, which is weird because they rejected Jimi Hendrix playing here. He's the only one that asked to play here. And they said no, but somehow Sonny Chirac got one. Um, I wanted, I wanted people to know that this just isn't black people acting wild and crazy, that this was a, a, a therapeutic thing. And for a lot of us, gospel music was the channel because we didn't know about dysfunctional families and therapy and life coaches that we have now. Did you have to fight to get the A Quest Love John credit approved? Um, I credit a Questlove join to, uh, yeah, I had to, I had to register that with the, the DGA and they, they approved it. Um, actually that was my, uh, production, uh, partner, Joseph Patel. <laughs> it was his suggestion. I was really trying not to insert myself in the film, uh, in the very beginning when I was like showing drafts to people, a lot of the, uh, a lot of the complaints I got was like, well, wait, you're not in this. Like, we need to hear your voice. And so I, I begrudgingly put my voice in the very beginning of the, the film, asking the first question. And that candid moment that I had with Musa Jackson at the end, uh, I actually, you know, we yelled cut, but I didn't realize that they kept the tape rolling. So that was the actual real conversation uh, that we were having when Musa Jackson, when I was telling Musa Jackson how like, uh that that was such a game changer uh ice breaking moment where you know we realized that not only is this a movie but we got to hand him his history back to him so um we were just having a conversation and the 
cameras happened to be uh, running, so we kept it in there. But um, yeah, I was I was I was really uh, careful not to insert myself in the story um, because I wanted this to stand on its own. And I also know that, or maybe I'm just in my head that you know, I, I guess I imagine there was a jury of people just waiting to you know on the sideline. So. Um, at the very last minute, I let a quest love join go through, and now uh, I gotta wear this every day. Which of the performers in the film would you most want to have played with? Um, you know, uh, of course, the captain obvious answer is Stevie Wonder. Um, but I, I will say that. Uh, you know, there's 40 hours worth of performance captured and you guys really only got to witness maybe 10 to 15 percent of it. Um, but as far as like musicianship and intensity, B.B. Uh, King's set was on fire. So I was like, if I were vicariously one of those drummers uh, during uh, the set, I would have probably really enjoyed my heart was closer with B.B. King set as far as just the, the musicianship and whatnot. Um, so yeah, I, I enjoyed his a lot. As a DJ, you're someone who tells stories via music. Were there parallels between using those muscles, mixing music and the discipline in which you approached this wealth of footage, assembling it in a way so that it tells a story and has a narrative balance? Uh, me being a DJ is, is exactly what informed me on how to tell the story. Like, you know, I remember back in school when, you know, we were learning about uh, the story arc, you know, establishing rising action, climax, falling action, ending. Um, I couldn't quite see it in the way that my, you know, my teachers back in school wanted me to see storylines. So, um, Again, I, I had to, I actually had to refer to Creative Quest. It's so weird. Like I was out of my head for that one second. I could blame it on like also surviving in the pandemic, you know, because we we really started the editing process at the top of the year where, in which you got to devote half the time to like your survival and your family's survival and oh, also this movie. Um, so I will say that there was a point where, um, I was wondering, like, could I take the same approach that I take to DJing or putting a show together with this movie? And that's exactly what I did. Um, so to start for starters, for five months, I just kept it on 24 hour loop, no matter where I was in the house or in the world. Um, and I if anything gave me goosebumps, then I took a note of it. And I felt like if there were at least 30 things that gave me goosebumps, we could have a foundation. So uh, I tend to work backwards. Whenever I'm given a project, the first thing I think about is what is the last 10 minutes of the show or the set that makes the person who goes home think like, man, that was incredible. Because usually the last 10 minutes of a show or a presentation is your chance to men in black flashy thing, your audience. And you know, I've had disastrous root shows where I knew Okay, if I make these the last two songs and do this certain things, they'll forget about what happened in you know middle of the show, and that happens a lot. So that's a trick I play, uh, and of course I I wanted to make my entry in the film world like my version of inserting myself in this film without me seeing it, kind of in a TikTok way. Tell me you're you're the director of this film without telling me you're a director. Uh, was Stevie Wonder's drum solo? I figured that was the best way for me to crash land into your lives as a director without really it being about me. And we have not seen Stevie Wonder in a sort of in this light of a drummer. Um, so I thought that was the perfect beginning. And that's pretty much how I crafted the show. I, I searched for my ending. I knew I wanted what my beginning was. And then I worked backwards. Uh, so I edited and pasted this film backwards as opposed to the other way. In the film, Sly and the Family Stone is described as, quote, transformative cool. And later there's talk about the power of freedom music. 
1969. Which artists or music genres do you see continuing that tradition of transformative cool and freedom music? Um, you know, it's weird. Uh, when when Greg Tate said that Sly was transformative cool, he actually dropped uh, a mighty seed in my head. So subsequently, while doing this film, I'm also working on my next book. I know I feel like such a product, guys, but that's that, that's how I work. Like it's it's almost it's like I'm using the Prince manual. You know, he already had around the world in the day ready. White right when Purple Rain was out. Like so, right now my mind is on October to March of next year, and I'm working on what I you know I'm promoting what I did last year. Um, but when he said transformative cool, and I really wanted to start to investigate. Uh, oftentimes you think of like counterculture and you think of like hippies or white people or whatnot, but I wanted to sort of investigate the black side of things. And what's, I, I saw an article by um, April Walker and she's describing um, a black woman that comes on the train and she's trying to describe what cool is. And for her, the greatest weapon that this black woman has, this very beautiful black woman gets on the train and she noticed that four key people positioned on the trains were oogling her. And um, from April's point of view, she said that the more that this woman ignored the gaze, the more she became cool because cool is more about what you leave out instead of what you bring in. And Sly, um, you know, preface, I'm now working on the Sly film. Um, I'm just realizing that Sly's role in the counterculture process in the Bay Area uh, really starts in 1962. So all those hippies that will become of age as teenagers and young people, when they're 13, 14, 15, they're listening to Sly as a disc jockey. And his radio show was really different back then. Like he was really like unhinged, like talking about the man and going against the system, like stuff you weren't talk supposed to talk about in 1963, 64 or so. Um, you know, his version of cool, uh, was more about not being of the system and sort of being cool is what you leave out, not what you bring in. And that's what I'm trying to process and learn right now. I hope I answered that question. Uh, this one's from Dan Leibarger. Uh, how much work did it take to make the audio work as well as it did in the final cut of the film? Man, I'm going to tell you, um, the million dollar question, there's two million dollar questions of this film that is still unanswered. One, um, as, as hard as I tried, I could not get any direct connection to Tony Lawrence. I don't know if he's a, alive or dead. I don't know where he lived, nothing of his legacy. The only paper trail I have of him are just of like of the people that we found. Uh, and the other thing was, how could that audio be so pristine? The audio that you hear in the movie, this is not to uh, discredit our, our wonderful sound team, um, especially Jimmy Douglas, who, you know, is to me, God engineer. He's the only engineer I've ever used on my albums of which I never had to micromanage. I just send him the stuff. He knows what to do. He sends it back to me and I have no complaints. Um, but I'll be honest with you. Um, we had to do maybe 2% adjustment on the audio. Like the audio that you hear with the music is the, the, the dry rough mix, the soundboard, like the, the reference mix. It sounded perfect. And for the life of me, I can't figure out how 12 microphones were utilized in a way so powerful, especially when like three of those, the Stevie Wonder set, three of those microphones are on his drum set that he only uses once and the other three on his other drummers. So six microphones for two sets of drums. And then the other six, Stevie's vocal, uh, one mic for the amp for the guitar and the bass combined. And the rest are on the, uh, the orchestra. And I'm trying to figure out for the life of me, why does this sound so crisp and pristine? And it's to the point where I'm almost tempted to strip down the roots ourselves. Uh, I called my production manager, telling them like, yo, they only used 12 to 15 microphones this whole production. 
and it sounds perfect. How many do we use? And with a straight face, he was like, oh, all 11 of you? You guys use 103 mics. <laughs> so <laughs> 103 outlets. So uh, yeah, I'm, I'm trying to figure out if we can, if the Roots as a band can even survive with just 15 microphones. This next one is from B. Kwame. Um, you've talked a lot about erasure of Black histories through the way this footage was just disregarded, but it seems that the erasure was apparent back in 1969. Woodstock got all the press and the moon landing was huge. What are the keys to pushing back on similar erasure today and beyond? Well, you know, this, this is uh, a step forward. I mean, this is the first time that I'm really seeing uh, conversations that were never had before, especially post-pandemic. We weren't talking about mental health for Black people, and we were we really weren't speaking of Black erasure. Um, of course, you know, previously before, years before, we we sort of coded it as like, cultural appropriation, which was like a really politically correct way of saying that. Um, in the 80s, we would just say like, yo, man, why you always bite my shit or whatever? Like, it was always sort of draped in, in slang so that you couldn't see the, 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 the heart or the sincerity of what the problem was. And, you know, be it, be it TikTok content or be it a festival, I know this one thing. Um, this isn't the only story out there. Uh, probably the most shocking thing that I've I've learned in the last month, like in the last three to four weeks, um, I've gotten DMs from you know professors at university letting me know that blah 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 shot uh, concert footage for twenty hours for something that they did over in New York. And then there was a da 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 festival, like, and all, all this. So this isn't the only footage that's just laying around um, unscathed. There's about six to seven others. Um, so, you know, perhaps maybe this film can be uh, an entry, a, 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 a sort of a sea change for these stories to finally get out and but really for us to acknowledge that yes even something as minuscule as content uh on social media or uh a, a a giant one of the first ever like black festivals is important to our history so you know the conversation is being had now normally it's it's you know the, the process is that we talk about it for three months and then we forget about it. So um, that'll remain to be seen. But I know as for me, um, I, I didn't come into this wanting to be a director or any of those things. Um, I do believe that, again, creativity is transferable. So um, this is not my last rodeo with telling our stories. If anything, I'm more obsessed now than ever to make sure that history is correct so that we don't forget who this artist is or that event is. This one's from Peter Gray. Do you think something like the Harlem Cultural Festival could be, could be or would be put together today? Um, yeah, you know, not to toot my own horn. I mean, right now festivals are, are all the rage. So, you know, um, I can say the the Roots Picnic is sort of in the vein of the the Harlem Cultural Festival, um, in the DMV area, the the Broccoli Festival. That's probably the bell of the ball right now. Um, the Broccoli Festival in DC, um, their their festival is is very similar to that. So we're starting to see, um, sort of regional, local festivals on this level happen now, like in the last five years, there's another festival that we do in Alabama. Um, I, my, my mind's drawing a blink right now, but yes, I, I do believe that 
you know, America is is catching up with festival culture. Like the, the prime reason why the Roots had to pull a Hendrix and move to Europe. We moved to Europe uh, in, in the UK. We lived there from 93 to about 97. Um, was basically because, you know, over in Europe, there were over 700 festivals to choose from. And we figured as a band, um, living in a country in which being a band was like a, a, a rare thing at the time, we were like one of seven groups with a record deal. Um, right now, it's, you know, I think with the major record deal, it's like what Migos and the Roots, <laughs> as far as non solo acts, or I mean, even groups, I'm not even talking about a band, but just people collaborating that like that's a rare thing. So we had to move to Europe for four years um, because we knew that festival culture was a thing in Europe. So in moving back to the United States, the first thing we said was, you know, if we have to show the world what we learned, what is that thing? So that's why we wanted to do the Roots Picnic to let people, you know, in our town know, like, this is how it is over there. So, you know, now now festivals are are kind of a thing. From Lamar Stevens, what format was the festival recorded on? And can you describe the storage environment where the film was actually stored? And then were you ultimately surprised that the film had not decayed over that time? Okay, so um, the it was it was really forward thinking. Now, normally in 1969, if you're going to document something, chances are you're going to use 16 millimeter. Um, it was Hal Tolshin's idea to film this on video because it's for television. So the quality looks like that of a uh, soap opera, like that sort of video, which was brand new at the time. Of course, you know, in the 80s, the mini cam is, you know, became the norm. Um, but back then, it was two inch reels, but man, these reels were so heavy. The reels could hold about an hour worth of footage. And I'll say that one, one of those uh, uh, canisters had to have been about 17 pounds. So even when we show, like that scene at the very end where we had to show like all the tapes piled onto each other. Uh, yeah, that was, that was a damn workout. You know, that was like lifting, <laughs> lifting boxes back and forth and you had to be very careful. Um, I'm extreme, you know, the, the basement environment that Hal Tolshin kept uh, his uh, tapes, it was pretty steady. You know, he had it in a dry room in his basement, but um there was only, I think at the time in 2018, there were only five, five uh, machines in the United States uh, that were still working. And I believe seven people who even had the expertise and the know-how on how to treat the film. It, it was a five month process. So the five month process that I'm watching uh, the video transfer of this movie because you know how probably spent a good nine years trying to sell this thing I think he gave up around like 77 78 maybe there's like one go around at the you know a, a possible 20th anniversary thing or whatever so they had made uh, copies of it on VHS like somewhere in the early 80s but um, during the time that we sent this out to be you know you got to bake the film uh sort of moisten a little bit so it doesn't snap. Um, yeah, that was a five month process. And they had to practically with every frame, lightly brush, um, lightly brush so that none of the film would be distorted. Um, all but one reel was really, everything was damn near perfect, which was, that was a miracle. Um, the staple singers reel uh, a performance one. The Staples were the only act to perform twice. Their first performance, uh, coupled with the rain, uh, the quality was a little weird, but you know, for the greater good, we still had to include it. All right, this is the last question uh, that we have time for. This one's from A.D. Amorosi. Uh, and the question is, the interviews, the big reveals, especially the fifth dimension, 
talk, can you talk about how you, your reactions to their reactions and how that shaped the film emotionally going forward? You know, the, um, uh, what's up, Eddie? How you doing? Good to, good to hear from you. Um, I'll say that the, the emotional component of the film was something that I wasn't preparing for. Um, and really didn't know what was going to happen. So it wasn't like, you know, it wasn't like, you know, the, the Barbara Walters moment where, you know, she's going to ask that question. It's like a carrot on the stick and, you know, I'm not going to cry. I'm not going to cry, that sort of thing. But, you know, only in conversation, if they touch on something, I might in investigate it. Um, the sort of uh, emotional trigger moment, at least for the Billy Davis and Merlin McCoo portion, um, was the fact that I noticed that I couldn't quite put my hand on it, but my memory of all the fifth dimension performances I saw were sort of uh, composed and, and steady and, and very posh and sophisticated. And um, this, this performance of theirs at the Harlem Cultural Festival was closer to that of a gospel revival. I've never heard Billy Day with the exception of like one of their songs on their solo records, a song called like Your Love. I've never heard Billy Davis Jr. use his raspy gospel baritone. Hey! Like that sort of James Brownish, sock it to me, that sort of thing. So, you know, I thought it was humorous. I was like, wow, Billy, like I never heard you use your gospel register before. And, you know, they kind of opened the door and said, you know, it's kind of cause like we were comfortable and excited to be there. Like it wasn't the pressure of, we're on the Ed Sullivan show or we're on the Jack Parr Tonight show. Like, so we have to, and I realized then, like I had a memento moment as they're describing this. One personally, I related to it because I realized like, oh, so black people have to code switch all the time. Like even on, like it's not just in the office space, but even in entertainment, because I related to that. You know, I'm a guy that has to adjust his show if we're performing, if we're touring with Beck, we got to do a show a certain way. If we're doing Wu-Tang Clan, certain way. If it's System of a Down, certain way. The next week is Erica Badu. So no one has more stress of, you know, call my 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 agent. Okay, we're, what part of town are we in? What's the what's the audience look like? Da 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 da. Like I have to, I have to code switch shows. Like all my shows aren't transferable to each audience. I had to adjust it for every place we go to. And I noticed that, and that was their way of telling me that they too had to go through that pressure. Probably the most telling moment of that festival that goes over people's heads was when I'm looking at David Ruffin's performance, it's the middle of August and he's wearing a wool tuxedo and a coat. And I'm like, why? And it hit me that you have to be, back then, you had to be professional, even the, to the detriment of your own comfort. Meanwhile, the most revolutionary performance to that audience, nothing will beat watching camera four of the Sly and the Family Stone performance when all the kids are losing their minds. It would be like if I were to take my nieces and nephews or like kids today, uh, if I'm at a Migos concert and as a 50 year old, I'm kind of like, Eh, they're not Wu-Tang Clan, but they're all right. And watching kids go crazy. That's what adults were doing to Sly and the Family Stone. Like, they'd never seen a Black act not wear a tuxedo. They were wearing their regular clothes. Not to mention the intersectional and all that other stuff uh, with the group that they'd never seen before. But, um, you know, in opening that door, also with Musa Jackson, um, he was five years old at the time. And... Uh, I was a little bit, I was like, mm, what, what five-year-old is going to give me insight of the emotional deepness of being there when he's five years old? And he, his, the thing that won us over was like, he's like, this is my first memory ever. But he wasn't sure he had it. So we purposely didn't show him any footage. We took all the photos down. Like none of, he saw none of this stuff for references. He just came into a dry room. We just said, tell us everything you know. And he spoke and it was like, yo. He's saying it, he's saying exactly like he remembers. So then once we showed him the footage, 
uh, suddenly the tears started welling because for him as a 57 year old, he didn't know if he remembered it. He didn't know if anyone believed him. Like if I didn't believe this happened as an adult, you know, who's going to believe a 10 year old, like, yeah, I saw Sly and the Family Stone and Nina Simone the other week in Harlem. Like no one's going to believe that. My friends will lie about going to the victory tour by the Jacksons. Like, yeah, we saw Michael Jack. No, you didn't. You lied. So for him, it was sort of like that little boy that cry at wolf exoneration moment. Like, I knew this happened. Like, that's why he started crying. So I didn't realize there was a heavy emotional component um, really until we allowed people to give commentary. And I'm so glad we made that decision instead of not doing that. All right, well, that is it from us. Thank you again to Amir Questlove Thompson and all of you guys for joining. And uh, thanks again. Thank you, guys. Thank you.